under the order, uh, order of precedence, where do these come from? Where do they start? <clears throat> Most originated from federal guidelines that grew out of, uh, you know, the growing support of research from the federal government after World War II. The government learned that many advances during World War II were from faculty at colleges and universities from across the country. As the support from the federal government grew over the years, um, individual agencies had their own rules and government decided to provide a common set of guidelines. These started out as individual OMB circulars issued for specific research entities, either universities or states and local governments or Indian tribes, nonprofits. They were meant, some of them were listed for just for grants and cooperative agreements. Uh, we have others for for profit companies. Federal acquisition regulations came along uh, with terms and conditions for contracts. In 2013, Office of Management and Budget combined eight circulars into one document, which we now know as the Uniform Guidance, UG. Uh, it became effective in December of 2014 and has had two major revisions uh, since the most recent one, with the most recent one being just in 2024. The first point to make is the Uniform Guidance is issued and applies to federal agency that make federal awards to non-federal entities. Spoiler alert, although the name states uniform guidance and implies uniformity, each agency still has some unique guidelines. This is sometimes based upon how their funds are appropriated by Congress, their mission, et cetera. Federal agencies adopted some federal wide and agency specific terms of research and research terms and conditions. Federal research terms and conditions implement the changes to the uniform guidance that were mandated by OMB. This overlay document incorporates the UG by reference, clarifying and supplementing select provisions where appropriate. These provide the groundwork for rules and guidelines. For more detailed information on your award, you may look to the program announcement, which provides additional information on who may apply, who may impose limits. You know, these may impose limits on the number of applications allowed for your institution or for the program and other specific uh, limitations. Reviewing the program announcement may identify that your organization is not eligible and thus might save you and central administration the time of preparing a, a proposal. Then you go to the prime award terms. Notice of the award may, from the agency or the sponsor, which may reference the latest budget and budget justification you submitted along with specific terms and conditions. Some may reference the agency's unique rules, such as a salary cap for an NIH award, or it might reference whether carry forward is it allowed uh, with or without agency approval, what terms and conditions are applicable to the award in case there's been a revision since the award was originally uh, awarded, and the amount of direct and indirect costs awarded, and define the budget year and or project period and potential future funding. In reference to it may also reference the location of the program announcement, the date your final proposal was submitted and other agency or sponsor guidelines. <clears throat> if you issue a sub award or are issued a sub award under a prime award, most of the terms and conditions flow down to the sub, but sometimes not all of them. If we receive a sub under a federal award from another entity, we treat it as a federal award. However, the passer entity does not have to flow down all terms. The pass-through entity can impose some restrictions on the sub, excuse me, if the sub does not have uh, an equipment policy or a travel policy, the pass-through entity may not allow such costs on the sub award, or it may require the sub to follow your institution's travel policy. A common one, the prime award may not uh, flow down is automatic carryover. The pass-through entity may not grant that to the sub. Then we also have public laws that come into play. Most common is the Fly America Act, but there are others. Then we have institutional policies that may impact our award. Certainly during COVID, while our awards allowed travel, many institutions impose travel restrictions on all university and sponsored travel. Given the current administration's recent orders, institutions may again cancel, limit, or delay travel on awards irrespective of the budget or the sponsor approval. Finally, you have common sense things your parents taught you not to do. Don't touch a hot stove. Some costs are clearly not allowable and they do not uh, benefit the award, but the PI may, may not wanna charge their own funds for it. Sponsored awards are never to be used for costs that do not benefit the award. Next.